Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar brought to you by the MSBA's Consumer Bankruptcy Section. I'm Andrea Terry, the Director of Learning for the MSBA. Today's program is titled The CARES Act, Impact on Bankruptcy Practice and Tips from the Trenches for These Unique Times. It's the first in a series of webinars that the section is planning to address the impact of the pandemic on your practice. If you want to pose questions, you may do so by typing them into the YouTube chat channel on the right of your screen, or you can email Chriselle Anderson at the email address at the bottom of your screen, Chriselle at msba.org. Your moderator today is attorney Richard London from the Consumer Bankruptcy Section, and I will turn the program over to Richard to introduce your esteemed faculty today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, as um, Andrea said, my name is Richard London, and welcome to the Consumer Bankruptcy Section's presentation of the effect of the CARES Act on bankruptcy. The Consumer Bankruptcy Section is comprised of attorneys who represent debtors and creditors in bankruptcy matters, uh, which could be consumer-related or business-related or both, and bankruptcy trustees. We have several very knowledgeable and experienced presenters on our program today. Robert Thomas and Rebecca Hur are Chapter 13 trustees in Maryland, and Ms. Hur is also the Chapter 13 trustee for the District of Columbia. They will talk about the effect on Chapter 13 plans, which are plans of reorganization of a consumer's debts with the use of their current income. Mark Kivitz and Bud Stephen Taman are private attorneys who have been practicing for many years in all phases of bankruptcy. Mark's office is located in Baltimore and Bud is in the District of Columbia suburbs. I represent primarily secured creditors and lessors and I have my office in the District of Columbia suburbs also. We will discuss the effect of the CARES Act on, um, uh, Bud and, and Mark will discuss the effect of the CARES Act on small business reorganizations, and um, Robert and Becky will discuss the effect on Chapter 13 plans. Okay, we can go to the next slide, Bill. Okay, now as you know, um, bankruptcy was affected by the CARES Act. The CARES Act is the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Our topics today are consumer reorganizations and small business reorganizations, which obviously dealt, which obviously deal with financially stressed individuals and entities to start with that are trying to rehabilitate themselves before the advent of the pandemic and now have to deal with the interruption of business and income that resulted. Um, the subchapter five small business chapter 11s are the first item listed on the slide. Um, this, the Small Business Reorganization Act is a subsection of chapter 11, which is typically a business reorganization. These can, uh, the regular chapter 11s can get complicated and expensive and take a long time to get from filing to a confirmed plan. So Congress enacted the Small Business Reorganization Act to come up with a less complicated, less expensive and streamlined program that has more flexibility for a small business. Ironically, the Small Business Reorganization Act became effective mid-February of this year, and then the coronavirus hit. Um, now, we're gonna talk about in the chapter 13 part, exclusion of stimulus payments from the means test. This means that the stimulus payments that come out under the CARES Act to consumers do not have to be devoted to the Chapter 13 plan or counted in for the Chapter 13 analysis. On the Chapter 13 plan modifications, the plans can be extended out if the consumer's ability to perform his or her plan is adversely affected by the virus. And for student loans, there's a provision with respect to federally held student loans, they will have an automatic suspension of principal and interest payments through September 30 of 2020. Next slide. Okay, so as far as the effect on subchapter five 
Subchapter 5, the small business chapter, is a subsection of Chapter 11. And the CARES Act, um, as I explained, takes the definition of the small business in the current Small Business Reorganization Act and increases the size of businesses that will be eligible to file under this section if they elect to do so. So that the streamlined process for small businesses will be available to larger entities. And this will be for one year. If the business decide that's the way it can go, it has up to a year to file under the um, increased threshold. And then the amendment sunsets and the definition goes back to the definition of a small business that's otherwise in, in subchapter five. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let me turn this over now to Robert and, and Becky to proceed with the chapter 13 changes. Thank you, Richard. Um, and hello to everybody out there. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, one of the important changes or that came out with the CARES Act was and protections that Congress put in is to protect families and individuals uh, that are going to be getting the stimulus payments that your clients may have um, received. And some of the protection that was put in place was dealing with calculating whether or not you have to calculate your payments on the means test calculation. So if you represent clients, one of the due diligence requirements is looking at their income for the six months prior to the bankruptcy filing. And by doing that, you're looking at their pay income, you're looking at their, you know, whether they get a pension, social security income, and bank statements and things like that. And one of the things that would come up is if they were getting or received a stimulus payment that was related to COVID-19. Well, under the changes under the CARES Act, you don't have to include the uh, stimulus payments in the means test calculations, meaning it would be excluded. Um, so you wouldn't calculate it in. And in regards to Chapter 13, as far as disposable income, um, it's not calculated in as far as regular income for your clients that would be proposing a Chapter 13 plan. So when you're looking at it from a client perspective, any of the stimulus payments um, doesn't don't have to be calculated into the means test calculation. It doesn't have to be calculated into whether or not your clients have disposable income for recommending a, a plan or a repayment plan. Now, you do have to watch, even though I don't think any trustees, at least I know the 13 trustees, I'm pretty confident the seven trustees um, or probably won't be looking at it, but it is potentially the stimulus checks are property of the bankruptcy estate. Now, you have exemptions available under both Maryland law and federal law. Um, and I can tell you that the United States trustee's office did put out a public document that pretty much, you know, reissued the fact that the trustees shouldn't be really looking at these payments as property state available to liquidate for creditors. So it's an important factor. So you really don't have to be worried about if your clients are holding that money, if it's in the account, you want to make sure you probably disclose it listed on your bankruptcy schedule, schedule B, but I don't see 13 trustees looking at it as affecting confirmation, and I would be surprised to see chapter seven trustees looking at it for any liquidation analysis. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so under the CARES Act, um, chapter 13 debtors who experience hardship due to the COVID pandemic um, can modify their plans to up to 84 months. This has been inserted into the bankruptcy code under section 1329D. Now, I guess we should discuss what does this mean exactly? Uh, first, the statute uh, states that it only applies to plans that were confirmed prior to the enactment of CARES. Um, the date of that enactment was March 27th, 2020. Um, so we have to remember that this applies only at this point to plans that were confirmed prior to March 27th, 2020. Of course, um, I know that many of you uh, think that this, this date may be arbitrary. I think Robert and I also have concerns about this date um, specifically. What if you had a case with a confirmation hearing on March 31st, which occurred after the enactment of CARES? Likewise, what if uh, our office had recommended confirmation of a plan um, and for whatever reason, the order wasn't signed until after March 27, 2020. I think there's gonna be um, a lot of cases that kind of interplay with this. And I think Robert and I have also discussed about 
uh, cases that were filed uh, right before the pandemic started, those cases are certainly affected by the same situations that would that already confirmed plans would be affected by. So um, at this point, the statute says that it applies only to plans confirmed prior to the enactment of CARES. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll have to see if anything else comes out in relation to that, if there's any changes there. Second, uh, the statute indicates that the debtor must have financial hardship directly or indirectly related to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this leaves a lot to interpretation by our courts and allows a lot of room for debtors to try to fit their cases within the language of that statute. Um, we do want to look to the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the state of Maryland. They've issued an administrative order. It's order number 2010. Uh, you'll want to look at that if you're going to file a motion to modify under 1329D. There in the administrative order, it says that the motion for approval of a modification of a confirmed plan to extend the plan up to a term of no more than seven years shall include information to support the requested relief. It, not, it needs to be accompanied by an affidavit verifying such information. This is, is probably the thing that I see um, that hasn't been coming in on the motions to modify, so make sure that you include the affidavit verifying the information. And then finally, it must conspicuously state that the debtor is seeking a modification pursuant to Section 1329D, which are those special COVID pr provisions. So what does the debtor need to show? First, they need to show financial hardship uh, that's related directly or indirectly to the COVID pandemic. And we've got a broad range of people that have been affected by the pandemic, but does it apply to, to everybody? Um, I, that's something that you're going to have to argue in these motions, I guess. Um, and then does it apply to people whose income hasn't decreased? Decreased. I know a lot of uh, debtors' attorneys have probably gotten the phone call. I've gotten the phone call. I'm sure Robert's also gotten phone calls from people who don't have an interruption in income, uh, whether they're retired and receiving their retirement benefits, uh, they're federal employees, so their income hasn't really changed. Um, or, you know, there could be some other situations. Um, now, I'm not saying that those people haven't been uh, fine, don't have a financial hardship for whatever reason. But if you have a case like that, you're going to have to do a little more, a little more digging, a little more explanation. So you want to make sure that that gets in the motion as well. Um, and finally, um, the length of the plan. So the, the section 1329D says that the debtors have the potential to extend their plan up to seven years after the first payment under the original confirmed plan is due. Uh, realistically, are many people going to be taking advantage of the entire seven years? Um, I tend to hope not, not just because um, that's, you know, a, a long period to be in a, in a case. But, you know, I think it's best for the debtors to, to try and resolve as quickly as possible and get out of their cases. So um, I don't know that I'll necessarily see a lot of cases extending all the way to seven years, but the debtors certainly do have that time period. You do want to remember that a motion to modify under Section 1329 does need to be filed within a year of the enactment of CARES. Um, and again, that enactment date was March 27th of this year. Um, I also did want to note for you guys um, that Administrative Order 2010 does also speak to a motion to suspend a wage order um, if your debtor has financial hardship um, because a family member uh, lost their job and they were depending on that income. Um, obviously, a wage order um, needs to be suspended so that we can make sure that the debtors are able to pay their regular ongoing payments. Um, and since it is an order, we need an order from the court vacating that order. So first of all, I'd ask you to consider, do you need a motion to suspend the wage, the wage order? Um, Self-employed debtors who are making direct payments, unemployed debtors whose jobs have been cut off because of the, the pandemic, or who are temporarily unemployed because of the pandemic, don't necessarily don't need a, a motion to suspend the wage order. Um, anyone making direct payments or anyone in a plan that's not yet confirmed, I would say that those are the four categories that don't need to file a motion to suspend the wage order. Um, but if you are going to file one, make sure that you include an affidavit or other evidence supporting the need for the requested relief, much like the motion to modify. And then uh, make sure that you read Administrative Order 2010 because it says that the motion and order must state that the motion to suspend does not reduce overall plan funding, and that the debtor will file a motion to modify the plan if that's the intended result. And I believe, Robert, you provided samples to go along with the program. Yeah, there's examples that uh, are drafts of the motion to suspend 
with the accompanying order that pretty much follows the court's order. So they are available. Um, so you should re reference those if you're going to be filing them. Um, so it, at least you've got a good draft to at least start from. And, those, and I'm pretty sure that once we review them and Becky and I or trustee will file a line of no opposition, the court will enter that order on an expedited basis. Um, so there's, the court is definitely aware and monitoring those. And so, and I know our, both of our offices are monitoring those to get those um, no opposition filed. So, you know, your clients don't have to go through any more uh, issues regarding that. Sorry, the important thing about the, the 13 plan modification and what it's really there for is if your clients have have you know reduced income or available income to cover their household expenses and they may have now decided that they wanted to forbear on their mortgage payments or maybe a car payment you know under the cares act so you know what what this plan modification will do is it will allow them to extend the plan out without increasing their plan payments um and bring in that post petition default or not really default but forbearance to allow them to cure that through a modified plan. I mean, that's really the kind of the intended purpose behind it is to give individuals the ability to not have to, you know, panic or struggle trying to come up with additional money or a lump sum payment or a consent order payment that will require, you know, making the chapter 13 plan payment, making the, uh, the consent order payment, and then the regular monthly mortgage payment. You can get, you know, and I, and Becky and I, and I, I've reached out to the secured lenders, attorneys, and let them know that I would prefer, at least from my, my perspective, and at least to make sure that debtors have the ability to make this work, is to bring those consent orders and those post petitions uh, payments into the modified plan, so that way they're not overstretched, and that way I, I can at least know that it's going to be much more successful, um, and that way we can avoid having, you know, your clients try to make all three payments at once. So I think this is definitely it's a benefit to clients, benefit to, um, and I think really the secured lenders too, because it's gonna get gets an organized um, payment method through the modified plan. And, you know, once we get that order on them, we can start to make payments and then we go out and continue to pay it. So definitely look at it if you've got clients that are doing that or doing a forbearance or either vehicles, cars, or, you know, real estate property, things like that. So I think we go to the next slide. Student loans. Um, the CARES Act does provide for your clients to be able, if they have federal loans, um, the Secretary of Education will defer student loan payments, principal and interest for six months through September 20th, 2020, without penalty to the borrower. So that's important. We see, Becky and I see a lot of cases where, you know, clients have student loan payments and, or they're in deferment, things like that. You know, definitely Congress looked at that and wanted to provide relief there without any, you know, reporting issues and things like that. So I think it's important that, you know, your clients are aware that they can, you know, get further payments on the student loans for principal and interest for six months. Um, and it won't be treated adversely against them. Um, and any loan forgiveness program or loan rehabilitation program. So it's just an important thing to reference if you're meeting with new clients and things like that that may be coming in, is, you know, the student loans. If they're worried about that, there is some provisions in the CARES Act that gives them some relief for at least till September. Now, that might change um, with uh, additional stimulus um, bills that may be coming before Congress. So, you know, obviously we'll update people as we see that going through. Next slide. And then as Richard beginning of the program um, these provisions are set to sunset with uh, remembering that the cares was enacted march 27th of this year uh, so just keep an eye on those uh, on that deadline um, and at this point uh, they are going to fade away after that time as as robert said if we see more statutes enacted or more legislation come through we'll certainly keep you guys updated as well um, you can go on to the next slide. Sorry, Robert, you're muted. You just need to unmute yourself. 
Sorry, um, got to get used to the mute buttons on these live. So one of the important things that, because we don't know necessarily the audience that we have, and we, if you have new attorneys or attorneys that are looking at bankruptcy issues for their clients, obviously during this period of time is, you know, a lot of people have experienced unemployment, layoffs, furloughs, and they're struggling to figure out how they're going to maintain their personal finances. I recommend, as everybody knows on the list serve and people say, is look at Chapter 13. Um, chapter 13 is so underrated as far as the protections that are involved and the flexibility that you have in managing your client's repayment plans through a three to five year plan. Um, you know, some of the big, you know, big things to look at is if your clients are behind on mortgage payments, behind on car payments, if they owe back taxes and their priority taxes that they have to repay within three years old, chapter 13 is, is definitely a way to, to allow your clients to reorganize and structure their debts to use their funds to get paid up on their back taxes without interest and penalties accruing. It allows them to cure and maintain their mortgage payments. That means if they have back payments they owe, three, six months, 10 months, you can bring those inside of the plan and spread them out and cure that default through the Chapter 13 plan. The other thing you can do in the Chapter 13 is, is, is called a cram down. You can value vehicles through a Chapter 13 plan or any secured debt to be a matter of fact. And potentially if, the, if a vehicle is over purchased within outside of three years or 910 days, cram down the value of the vehicle through the plan and pay it through the plan, it's replacement value. You can also cram down the interest rate um, to what we refer to as a Supreme Court case in rate till, which is based off of the prime interest rate, which is right now 3.25, and you add one or two discount points. So potentially reducing a car interest rate loan that's 24% down to maybe 4.25, um, and use that to be paid through your client's plan to help them fund the plan and have the car paid off within five years. Um, it, chapter 13 gives you the flexibility. You can amend the plan up to confirmation. You can modify a plan after confirmation. Um, if certain scenarios arise in your clients, you know, three to five year term, their changes, life changes, you know, chapter 13 allows you to go back and, and look at and, and modify the plan out that based on what, you know, life has brought to your clients. Um, you know, as trustees, Becky and I, Tim, we all understand that everybody goes through different circumstances in life. And so, you know, if there's always issues or things like that. You can always reach out to us. If you have a question, issue, um, you know, we'll look at it and try to make a, come up with a solution that can usually work for your clients as things go on, because we don't have a crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball. Becky doesn't have a crystal ball. Tim doesn't have a crystal ball. Life brings challenges, just like life to all of us has brought COVID-19 which nobody could ever expect or plan for. So, you know, I think 13 presents a lot of good benefits for clients and it's in some of the materials that we provided just to go over because if you've got issues regarding equity, if you've got issues that, you know, income that may go up, down, and, you know, 13 can provide that flexibility and you remain in control with your clients over the plan um, and you avoid issues where, you know, maybe a seven trustee might be looking at equity in real estate um, or, you know, possible equity and inheritance or things like that. Usually all those can be addressed through a Chapter 13 plan. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention today was just the big the importance of Chapter 13 and how it can provide a lot of benefits for potential clients in getting through a crisis like this. Um, and, you know, so you, you can, you have this tool available, much like a reorganization where if you, even if they're self-employed, they can and, and definitely reorganize their finances so they can come out successfully with a discharge and curing and maintaining any secured debts and paying back a lot of the, the back taxes. We see a lot of cases where a lot of people owe a lot of back taxes, whether it be the state of Maryland or the IRS. And installment payments are great, but interest and penalties don't stop. Um, so if they're paying $200 a month off of you know forty or $50,000, you know, type of tax law that they're not going to give very far, but at least in the 13, you, you know, he can prioritize that, that interesting penalties to stop. And then the money that comes in will go to pay those off. And so at least when they get done, that tax obligations can be wiped out. So 
definitely 13 is where you should be looking at if you've got an emergency type case, if you've got um, issues regarding their, they owe back payments on secured debts. The automatic stay is important. Here's your clients, the breathing room um, to reorganize um, and to formulate a plan to keep everything at bay. So, I mean, one of the things that I would recommend is definitely you should be learning and looking at chapter 13 um, for clients that may be experiencing difficulties now layoffs or furloughs. Um, one thing I would mention is when you're looking at the motions to modify, you know, if your clients have a temporary type of reduced income, you know, you got to be thinking about too is whether or not, you know, will the trustee be looking to ask for additional income review every year? Um, you know, if it's been like, if they're switching jobs, maybe one thing, but if it's like a three to six month just re reduction, you know, we may be asking, so don't be surprised if, are they going to go back to work? You know, we may be asking that maybe we need to have in the modified plan that an amended I and J be filed every year or, you know, tax return being provided so we can at least monitor the income. So just be aware of that, you, you know, depends on the trustee, but on the circumstances of each case, but definitely look at the motions to modify. I mean, Becky, do you have things to add? Sorry. <laughs> no. So the important takeaway today is that we've got the initial CARES Act provisions. Your clients have protections that your stimulus payments won't be definitely subject to a trustee liquidating or 13 trustees looking at it to bring in additional income to a plan. You don't have to calculate them for the means test calculation. And then you've got the important provision where you can now modify a plan out 84 months to allow for your clients to spread out any post-petition um, arrearages they may have accrued. And with that, what the trustees and a group has looked at is, and obviously we know attorneys are going through issues just like everybody else, is trying to get the court, and I think the court's gonna look at is allowing for some post-petition streamlined application process on a no-look type a la carte basis. Um, that will provide attorneys additional fees for the additional services they're going to be providing that are going to arise from COVID-19. Um, and that could be whether the motions to modify the plans, motions to modify secured debt. Um, so there's going to be an additional, I think, coming order from the court that is hopefully going to provide for streamlined process, streamlined application. We're talking two pages, pretty straightforward, shouldn't take a long time to use, and an a la carte fee based on what we determined were reasonable fees um, for the services provided. Now, obviously in 13, sometimes that doesn't cover everything. You know, you're always free to file your cases on an hourly basis. Um, we do have the no look fee appendix F in place, but I think now recognizing the fact that there are gonna be additional work that isn't contemplated and you know, nobody, when we did the appendix F fee structure, it wasn't contemplated that, that cases will go seven years. So we've also, I've recommended that there be an additional fee if a plan is extended out to seven years that would allow for additional funds to the attorney um, for monitoring, taking calls, for reviewing trustee reports and things like that. Um, so at least it, it, accounts, it accounts for the fact that the plans are now maybe going out to seven years and additional work that may be involved. So look for that to come. Um, I've seen people file applications now and we're trying to approve them, but they're trying to work on a streamlined process that'll be pretty transparent and pretty, I think pretty easy to set up for attorneys to get these filed for the additional work that they're gonna do. Um, so look for that to come. And then just be aware of the orders that are coming out um, regarding any you know changes that may be coming from the court. Um, you know, One of the things that we're looking at is trying to set up confirmation hearings and you know we're looking at the Zoom capabilities for that with the court. Um, so I suspect in the near future, we should have some uh, movement on scheduling confirmations via Zoom if we had contested matters that would make it continued out, but just a standard forum to allow for a hearing to be held and to allow for you know, motions to dismiss possibly to go forward and things like that. And Becky, do you have anything to add to that? I was trying to find my mute. Um, no, I don't. I don't really have anything I would say. Just um, for the people who do have cases that are still in the pipeline, ready to get confirmed, 
Um, we're hoping to get as many up to the edge of confirmation and ready for their order as possible. So, um, for you to continue working on the cases as much as you can. I know that it's difficult to get hold of at this point. Uh, please be in contact with us if uh, your client is unable to make plan payments. Um, as I said before, if you're in an unconfirmed case, it's very easy to amend your proposed plan and hopefully get the debtors back on track if they are back to work or going back to work soon. Um, so we are trying to get these cases going. Um, so I just ask that everybody continue doing the, the work that they've been doing. I think everybody has done a really great job of getting up um, with the technology as fast as humanly possible. And I think that as, you know, as Robert indicated, the court is looking to move forward with hearings. And I think everybody's going to be ready to go uh, once we get to that June and July. Um, so just look for that information out there. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Please let the court know. I'm sure that they they will be getting a lot of, of questions as well. So, um, but that's about it. Um, I think that, that 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 covers what I had to say today. Yeah, can we go to the next slide? All right, just for informational purposes for the audience that we have out there, the filing fee um, for Chapter 13 is $310. If you look at the local rules for Maryland, there's an Appendix F that outlines the fees that a NOLA fee charge of 4,925 that can be paid through a chapter 13 plan. Um, you're gonna have clients that come in and they're gonna be struggling. They're gonna say, how can I afford you? Or they're gonna call you up on the phone or a new client and you know ask you how much does a 13 charge? Well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to quote them prices over the phone, but maybe get them into your office, review the fees with them. The fees I think are pretty reasonable. The, the flat rate fee is it's definitely, I think pretty good. It's when it's in this top eight flat rate fee in the country, so it's a good flat rate fee. Um, those fees can be paid through the plan. You can do a retainer up front along with the filing fee. So it's definitely, you know, if you have clients that are struggling, Chapter 13 can definitely be set up that you can get the filing fee paid and get your fees paid through the plan. Um, and generally, you know, the trustees pay the fees at conf after confirmation. Um, so the faster you move on getting your cases ready, getting the amendments filed, reviewing the claims, and getting the, the, the case in a posture to confirm. We can get it hopefully recommended for confirmation, then you know, within a month, get the you know distributions out to attorneys. So it's important now to get those amended plans filed, get your cases ready. So when we're feedback on the, you know, back to our normal schedule, we can process these cases and, and get everything, you know, dispersed out to attorneys. So Definitely look at Chapter 13 as far as you know, struggling clients that don't have a lot of money up front um, and use it to your advantage to, to you know, kind of sell it to them that, hey, if we can do a 13, your fees can be paid through the plan. You don't have to panic, you don't have to struggle. We can get you caught up on the on your house payments and car payments and you know, definitely look at Chapter 13. Becky and I and, and Tim are always available for questions, issues, emails. Um, and you know you can always post to listserv questions and we usually try to like i try to respond on not always don't always give the best answer but i usually will figure out something to give you some information or email you directly um and so it's important to communicate it's important to you know use all the tools they have available whether it be chapter 7 chapter 13 or now possibly the you know the small business sub chapter v chapter 11 for your clients and i think this is a good segue over to the next presenters. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I didn't have my sound on. Um, Robert and Becky, thanks. Uh, let's move on to the um, small business uh, portion. So um, the slide says, uh, COVID-19 and small business bankruptcy, watch out for the thorns. I, as I mentioned, it's the simpler, uh, less expensive, less complicated, more streamlined small business um, provisions. But just like any bankruptcy uh, case, there's going to be rules that have to be followed, uh, different um, circumstances depending on the facts. So let's see how we got here. Uh, next slide, Bill. All right, so 
I had mentioned before that um, February 19th was the um, day that the Small Business Reorganization Act became effective. And then, as you can see, within several weeks after that, we had our state of emergency and uh, uh, then the shutdown order uh, of March 23rd. It just so happens, like we've mentioned before, that the CARES Act became effective March 27th. So it was right on the heels of the whole shutdown because that was the reason for it being um, enacted. Uh, of course, now we're going through a partial and gradual reopening. Um, the governor's taken off the brakes to a certain extent with most of the counties. Uh, from what I understand, Montgomery, Prince George's, and Charles are still limiting the reopening, and, and I believe there's different rules in different counties also, but we're getting there. Um, next slide. So the background of the Small Business Reorganization Act, um, I think I sort of mentioned before, but this law was drafted to address concerns that the uh, business community had that the regular Chapter 13 process was just too complicated, expensive, and time-consuming for your smaller business concerns. And as a result, smaller businesses did not have a very good option to reorganize due to the ex expense involved, which only left the prospect of liquidating and going out of business. Um, and of course, companies that were harmed by the coronavirus shutdown certainly couldn't afford the Chapter 11 expense. And even, and even larger companies under the CARES Act would would be needing the streamlined process. And that's why for this one year period, the definition of a small business that can take advantage of this act was increased by the uh, monetary amount. So you'll see um, in the second bullet point that um, we, we were at 2,725 for the amount of the non-contingent liquidated secured and unsecured debts. And then the third bullet point, now it went up to seven and a half million dollars for the year period of the effectiveness of the act. Um, also, the debtor must voluntarily elect to proceed under the act. It's not automatic. The debtor has to determine if they would end up doing better under the act, which generally is the case. Um, next slide. Okay, um, is this you, bud? Mark. I oh, think Mark. it's me, okay. Richard. Thank you. Mark. Okay. Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Mark Kibitz. I had the privilege of serving as the first law clerk to the United States Bankruptcy Court for the late Honorable Harvey M. Leibowitz in 1979 to 1980, and I've been practicing both personal and business bankruptcy for low these many 40 years. I've been involved in Chapter 11 cases, and as you've heard from Becky Herr and Robert Thomas, Chapter 13 is a wonderful reorganization, but it is only for individuals, persons. Corporations, LLCs, limited partnerships cannot file Chapter 13, unfortunately. Individuals who may qualify for Chapter 13 may still want to consider a Chapter 11 reorganization. I'll come back to that thought. Chapter 13 also has debt limits, so that even if you are an individual and you want to file in Chapter 13, your unsecured debt or your secured debt, anything with collateral, mortgages, car financing, furniture financing, if you exceed either of the debt limits in Chapter 13, you no longer qualify for Chapter 13. And then to reorganize, an individual would have to consider a Chapter 11 case. As you've also heard, Chapter 13 for plans that were confirmed before the effective date of the CARES Act on March 27, 2020, were limited to 60 months. If they were confirmed prior to that effective date, then they can go out, as Becky and Robert have indicated, seven years, 84 months. A Chapter 11 
doesn't have that limitation. It can be five years. It could be seven years. It could be 10 years if that's the period of time that the debtor needs in order to address secured obligations, priority tax obligations, debts that might not be dischargeable, such as alimony, support, or maintenance, and the payment of unsecured debts to the extent of the debtor's non-exempt assets or the debtor's ability to pay over a period of time. The three basic benefits out of any bankruptcy are an automatic stay, an injunction that prevents creditors' actions against the debtor or the debtor's assets immediately upon the filing of the case and the assignment of a case number. Second, as we've indicated, time over which to address the repayment of obligations, tax liabilities in full with interest over a period of years under a plan, secured debt out over a period of time, some portion of unsecured debts. A plan of reorganization provides a debtor with time to address his or her or its obligations. And then ultimately, as in Chapter 13, in Chapter 11, the individual gets a debtor upon completion of a plan of repayment. For a corporate entity, the discharge of obligations occurs upon the approval of a plan, and then the corporate debtor is left with the obligations to perform its contractual obligations under whatever confirmed plan the court has approved. Then along came SABRA. That's an Israeli native. The Small Business Reorganization Act. And it had several immediate benefits. A regular Chapter 11 case, what I would call a non-small business case, requires the debtor to file a disclosure statement. It's like an SEC prospectus. It's about the assets of the individual or the company, the value of those assets at fair market and liquidation, the performance of the debtor before it filed or before he or she filed, and what caused them to file the Chapter 11 case. The disclosure statement would also indicate post-bankruptcy performance. Disclosure ultimately would also summarize the plan, dividing the debtor's creditors into categories, secured, administrative creditors, those that arise after the filing of case, such as attorneys and accountants, unsecured debts, and if it's a corporate entity, stockholders. One of the benefits that just took me 10, about five minutes to describe what a disclosure statement is. One of the benefits of a small business reorganization case is that it does not require the filing of a disclosure statement. Now, to be sure, if you're going to do a plan of reorganization, either for an individual or a corporate entity under a small business reorganization case, you certainly want to give the creditors as much information as you can in order to sell the plan and get them to vote on it. Because creditors do have the obligation and right to vote on a plan in order to get it approved by the court. One of the other benefits of a small business reorganization case, again, for both individuals or corporate entities, is that there are no U.S. trustee quarterly fees charged in a small business reorganization case. In a regular Chapter 11, there are monthly operating reports filed, both by companies and individuals, that indicate what income they had and what disbursements they made. The United States Trustee's Office calculates the total of expenses for a calendar quarter, January 1 to March 31st, April 1st to June 30th, and so on. And by adding up the expenses in each of these three months for each calendar quarter, the total of those expenses is plugged into a chart, and the debtor in a regular Chapter 11 case, would have the obligation to pay a quarterly fee as a fee for the privilege of being in a Chapter 11 case. That does not apply in a small business reorganization case. So there is a considerable savings that the debtor can realize by a small business reorganization case. A third difference for a SABRA case. In a regular Chapter 11 for a corporate entity, if the debtor corporate entity, partnership, limited partnership, if it's not paying 100% of its unsecured debt, which is a rarity, then in order for the ownership of that company to retain ownership, it has to, in the regular Chapter 11 case, 
put in new value. It is called the absolute priority rule. The last rung on the ladder, you start with administrative debt, secured debt, priority debt, taxes, domestic support obligations, sound money support maintenance, unsecured creditors, and then the bottom rung of the ladder is stock ownership or LLC membership interests of a corporate entity. The owners of the Chapter 11 corporate entity do not get to keep their stock ownership if they're not returning 100% of the unsecured debt. It's called the absolute priority rule. And they have to contribute new value based upon the value of their LLC membership interest or stock membership interest generally valued at the time of the approval of a plan of reorganization. Confirmation, it's called. But that absolute priority rule does not apply to a case filed under subchapter 5 of Title 11, the Small Business Reorganization Act. Then one of my favorite issues. In Chapter 11, in Chapter 12, farmers, and in Chapter 13, there is a restriction on the ability to cram down, that is to change the amount of a secured debt, the interest rate charged on the secured debt, the number of months or years over which the secured debt is repaid. There's a restriction in chapters 11, 12, and 13. It says that you cannot modify, that is to change any of those three terms, how much, how long, and at what interest rate. You cannot modify a security interest. That's a consensually granted mortgage or deed of trust. If the collateral is solely the debtor's principal residence. Now, of course, we're talking about individual debtors who file Chapter 11 cases or cases under SABRA. SABRA has a Wonderful provision. And parenthetically, I will add that the Maryland State Bar is about to publish a text that Jan Berlage and I wrote about exemptions and lien stripping, which I've had the privilege of teaching for the past 35 years. That restriction in chapters 11, 12, and 13 that says you cannot modify a security interest, mortgage or deed of trust, if it's secured solely by a principal residence, does not apply in a Sabra small business reorganization case. What does that mean? Well, listen, you ask your client when he bought his house, and he says it was bought in 2010. You check the Maryland land records, and you find that the mortgage is dated 2018. Obviously, there was a refinance. And you ask the debtor, what did you do with that money? Now, It's a personal mortgage. The affidavit says it's a personal mortgage. The interest rate is for a personal loan, not for a higher interest business loan. And the debtor tells you in 2018, when he refinanced his home, he took the money and he paid off debt owed by his business, or he bought merchandise, or he or she got a tanker line or vehicles, or did something else with the funds for a business purpose. The only evidence of that might be the deposit of the mortgage check into the corporate bank account and what was spent. But let's say instead of 2018, let's say the refinance occurred in 2010. That's 10 years ago. What evidence might your client have that the funds from this refinance were used for business purposes? Well, there's always the debtor's testimony. I asked this question of Judge David Rice, and David Rice said, Judge Rice said, that testimony is still good evidence in his court. And I said, I'll be sure to bring my Sabra loan refinance cram down action in your court, Your Honor. So what does this mean? Let's say that the house now is worth $100,000. But the refinance occurring two years ago or 10 years ago might have been $130,000 as a present balance. Well, Because there's no restriction on modifying a mortgage or deed of trust secured solely by a principal residence, you can file, on behalf of the debtor, a motion to determine the extent of the lien. In my example, the extent of the lien is the value of the house, $100,000, not the $130,000 balance on the mortgage or deed of trust. You can ask the bankruptcy court to reduce the debt from $130,000 down to $100,000. Strip off the extra thirty grand. That's 
addressing the first aspect of every secured loan, how much you can reduce the loan balance down to the value of the collateral. Next, when your debtor refinanced a couple of years ago or a decade ago, they charged him 15%. Well, as Robert Thomas mentioned just a few moments ago, SCS Corporation versus Till, the Supreme Court case in 2004, allows us to apply the current interest rate. And we use the Wall Street Journal interest rate and the national prime rate of interest. Right now, it's, as you said, three and a quarter. Well, we add an additional 1% perhaps for a risk of loss. And so if the loan interest rate two or 15 years ago or 10 years ago was 15%, you could ask the bankruptcy court to reduce the interest rate down to four and a quarter percent. Let's say it was a short-term refinance loan. Let's say it was only a 10-year loan and it was done in 2018. You can ask the bankruptcy court to extend the term out another 10 or 15 years if you wish, even beyond the life of a plan of reorganization. Now, I understand the longer you pay a loan, the more interest you have to pay. But if you're able to reduce it from a 15% business loan down to four and a quarter percent, you, you can be a hero on behalf of your clients. So you have the obligation to address what liens exist, but you also have the opportunity to modify them, to cram down the balance on the loan down to the value of the collateral of the house. You can, ex you can change the amount of the loan, the principal. You can change the interest rate. You can extend the term, modifying one, two, or all three of those terms of every secured debt in bankruptcy. Regardless of whether it's secured by furniture, by um, equipment, by a car, and there's no restriction if the collateral is solely the principal residence. That is a marvelous benefit that Sabra provides to us. At this point, um, my email address is mkivitz at AOL.com. My phone number is 410-625-2300. There were many of our friends who have since passed on who answered my questions 40 years ago when I was a pup. I make the following offer in earnest. If you have a question, ask. Send it to us. Post it on the listserv. We will do our best to reply. I will do my best to respond as others did for me. I thank you for the opportunity to participate. I think the next slide belongs to Mr. Taman. Thank you, Mark. It couldn't have been planned better if it was planned. Um, but the Small Business Reorganization Act came along just in the nick of time. No one really knew that. It was years, it was a few years in the making. Um, and it was actually enacted, I believe, probably in the summer um, with an effective date. Um, of the February 19th date. Um, so there was a six month lead time after it was enacted. Um, everyone knew that it was going to come and that it was going to be effective in six months. No one knew that six and a half months after that, there'd be business shutdowns. Um, and the Small Business Reorganization Act is designed, as has already been said here, to make it easier for a small business to reorganize under chapter 11. Um, not only does it make the process a little less expensive, although it is still an expensive process, um, but especially with the um, elimination of the absolute priority rule, um, it makes reorganization much more possible for a small business. The absolute priority rule is often a reason why businesses cannot get a plan confirmed or anyone, uh, individual or business, in a Chapter 11. The absolute priority rule really, really prevents that. So the Small Business Reorganization Act, um, COVID-19 aside, has its own special purposes. But with COVID-19, and the business shutdowns, it becomes even more crucial. And that has nothing to do with the fact that the CARES Act increased the debt limit to seven and a half billion. That's a nice benefit, which will be very, very helpful. Um, 
essentially what we have here is a situation where um, on March 23rd, uh, business was, businesses were, were given a few hours notice that they had to shut down unless they were deemed essential. Um, that's, you know, that, that's a remarkable thing to think about. Um, it didn't happen to any of us because lawyers are essential. So, you know, personally, we didn't really notice that difference. But if you can think about what it might have been like if all of a sudden you couldn't practice law um, anymore until further notice, and you got about three hours worth of notice or five hours maybe notice and lead time for you to shut down. Um, you know, when you think about that, it's it's pretty drastic. Um, the what's what's happening with the businesses that have shut down, which is the majority of them, and putting PPP and EIDL aside, some businesses have gotten them, others are struggling to get them. Just about everyone who's gotten one is struggling to figure out how to work with them. But putting that aside, we have these businesses that are shut down. The There's going to be extensive financial damage for the business. There's going to be unpaid salaries. There's going to be unpaid taxes. There's going to be unpaid suppliers. Uh, the rent and mortgage defaults are going to be substantial as well. And the Small Business Act is designed as any frankly, any bankruptcy chapter uh, is designed to provide relief for all of those problems. That is what bankruptcy does. Next slide, please. So we're in a situation where we have mass shutdowns and the emotions that go with that. And when you think about, um, I remember when I first started out and I had a, uh, I would defend it against a landlord's lift stay. I represented a pizza uh, store, a pizza shop in suburban Baltimore. And um, the landlord was able to, you know, um, kick the tenant out. And um, the landlord was complaining about, um, how they've been inconvenienced and how they've suffered financially. And um, I remember Judge Snyder saying, well, you know, everyone, everyone's dreams were shattered here. Um, that, that's the, that, that's where the business comes from. The businesses, uh, people have put their blood, sweat, and tears in the business, and all of a sudden it's sort of snatched out from under them uh, for some, uh, perhaps forever. Um, but the point is that within with this few hours of notice, there was no time to plan. There was too much to do, too much to think about, not the least of which was thinking about how to protect yourself in the pandemic that we are all facing. Next slide, please. And if you can take a look at the quote at the top of this slide and remind yourself of that um, as words to live by, it really can guide you as a lawyer. Um, the job of a lawyer is to, you know, be distant from the client's problems and be able to help the client sort through the problem and resolve the problem. And obviously the lawyer can't do that if the lawyer is you know all wrapped up in the problem but not from that you know objective distance and while it applies any time in the practice of law it really applies now uh, because of all of the panic and because of everybody having their livelihoods ripped out from under them we're just focused on the small business aspect in this program, or at least this part of the program, it clearly applies to individuals as well, and the people that have lost their jobs and who have tried to get unemployment and still haven't, and haven't gotten any stimulus money either. This program isn't dealing with, with, th with that problem, which is just as substantial. So you've got clients who don't know what to do, and everything's been thrown at them, and the bottom has the rug has been pulled out. 
it's up to it's up to the attorneys to look at that and take it methodically one step at a time and sort through everything and not let the clients panic dictate what's done for them legally the attorney you know still needs to step back and try to figure out the best options next slide please You know, again, that's something that we always should do with every single case that we work on. But in, in regard to, to the business shutdowns as a result of the pandemic, it's even more acute when it comes to dealing with the business owner who comes to see you and they're just, they, you know, they're, they're a puppet without a string. When you think about the shutdown without any planning whatsoever and without any intention of, you know, you go to work one day and you find that you have to close your doors for an indefinite period that, that evening. Um, what you need to be focused on here is to make sure, I mean, the easy answer is yes, bankruptcy can fix their problems. Uh, it, it, for some problems, it's it's difficult, and it, it can help a little. Maybe it can't fix it entirely. For a number of problems, it can fix it entirely. Um, it's a it's you know it's a it's a very good last resort. But you have to focus on the fact that because the businesses were shut down as they were, that things that might be ordinary transactions which were done knowing that there's a tomorrow. May, there may not be a tomorrow, and those ordinary transactions could, could end up turning into preferential transfers or fraudulent conveyances, both of which are recoverable by a trustee in bankruptcy, depending on the facts of the case. Um, and it's up to the attorney, regardless of the client's panic, it's up to the attorney to examine the books and records extremely carefully and discuss things that didn't make it to the books and records because there are going to be transactions and events which are not going to be recorded because there really wasn't time and there was too much else to deal with from a personal survival level to care about recording things in the books and records. So. You know, there needs to be extrinsic, an extrinsic evidence review, if you will. Um, and because what, what happens is when a trustee does recover um, a preference or a fraudulent conveyance, somebody gets hurt in that process. And there's nothing worse than having that happen when the debtor had no idea it was going to happen. And it was something that the debtor would prefer not to happen. The point is, it needs to be ascertained before a bankruptcy is filed. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the uh, what a preference and a fraudulent conveyance is, essentially the preference is found um, in Section 547 of the Bankruptcy Code, and the elements are laid out in 547B. Essentially, a preference is a transfer or payment of a debtor's interest in property to a creditor for a debt which is owed at the time the payment is made, made while the debtor is insolvent, and there is a presumption of insolvency for the 90 days before the bankruptcy is filed. With a payment or transfer being made, within 90 days of the bankruptcy being filed if the creditor is a non-insider and within a year before the bankruptcy is filed if the creditor is an insider. And the payment or transfer enables the creditor to receive more than they would receive if the case were a case under Chapter 7, if the transfer had not been made, and if the, if the creditor 
by the transfer or payment received more than they would get through a Chapter 7 distribution. Now, there are a number of defenses to a preference, and um, it is certainly, you know, the, included in the defenses. The defenses are, are located at 547C, but every one of those elements have to be proven as well. So essentially, the elements of a preference are also defenses because, you know, a defendant can attack any one of those elements. Uh, but the point is, even if the defendant wins in a preference case, they lose because it's always an expensive proposition to defend. Um, a fraudulent conveyance is found at Section 548A of the Bankruptcy Code. It's also found in most state laws. Um, most state law has a fraudulent conveyance statute in it. Uh, they're, you know, they're similar, and they're similar to the bankruptcy code statute, but there can be differences. A trustee in bankruptcy can recover a fraudulent conveyance either under bankruptcy law or under state law, depending on, uh, usually it's going to depend on the time um, that has passed since the transfer, but it could depend on other factors as well. In any event, what a fraudulent conveyance is, is a transfer or a debt obligation which is uh, made or incurred with the actual intent to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor that exists at the time of the transfer or a future creditor. That's, that's one type of fraudulent conveyance. The other type of fraudulent conveyance is not actual fraud, it's constructive fraud. And in that, in that cause of action, the... Um, debtor has to have received less than reasonably equivalent value in exchange for the transfer or the incurrence of the debt obligation in addition to um, either one of four things. The first one, the debtor has to be insolvent at the time of the transfer or has become insolvent as a result of the transfer, and there is no presumption of insolvency with a fraudulent conveyance as there is with, as there is with a preference. Or the debtor is engaged in business or in a transaction or is about to be engaged in business or a transaction with, for which the property or the assets which remain with the debtor constitute an unreasonably small capital. Or the debtor intended to incur or believed that the debtor would be intending to incur debts that the debtor could not pay when due. Or, and finally, and this one actually could have some, um, could have some um, more validity in, in the context of the shutdown, the debtor had to transfer um, or incur an obligation to or for the benefit of an insider under an employment contract and not in the ordinary course of business. Um, next slide, please. Anytime that you're looking at a, um, anytime that you're, you're looking at a bankruptcy and you, you, especially with a small business case, um, where you need to review the ramifications on the principal and on people that the principal cares about or entities that the principal cares about, primarily because of avoidance actions like preferences and fraudulent conveyances, you need you, you can sometimes time the filing of the bankruptcy to an extent that you can file the case after the cause of action would no longer be viable. And if you have the luxury of time, you don't always have the luxury of that time. But if you do, you need to be looking at that. And again, in the the case with the business shutdowns, that's part of the not losing your head while everyone around you is losing theirs. You have to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So in the case of a preference, um, if you see that there is a transfer or obligation which could be an avoidable or a potentially avoidable transaction, um, preferential transaction. Um, you, if, if you avoid the filing of the bankruptcy case 
for 90 days after the legally cognizable date of the transfer to a non-insider transferee, you will eliminate the preference from being a problem. In the case of an insider transferee, you have to wait a year after the legally cognizable date of the preferential transfer. The reason I said legally cognizable date is because it's not always clear when the date starts as to when the preference period starts. And you have to figure that part out. Uh, when it comes to a check, um, the date is when the check is paid by the bank. With cash, it's when the, the date the cash is paid to the person, um, to the transferee. So you, you have to ascertain the date it starts and then figure the preference period. In the case of a fraudulent conveyance, if you find that there are transfers or other transactions which could be uh, uh, lead to an avoidance action for a fraudulent conveyance, um, if you would need to wait until two years after the legally cognizable date of the conveyance uh, to file the bankruptcy case, if in order to avoid the fraudulent conveyance to be avoided under the bankruptcy code. However, um, if it's, it, you also have to figure where state law comes in because, for instance, in Maryland, the statute of limitations for Maryland is three years from the transaction. So if it's a Maryland transaction, you're going to wait until after the expiration of the Maryland state law statute of limitations runs because the trustee can bring a fraudulent conveyance action under Maryland law in the bankruptcy court through bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy code section 544, which is otherwise known as the strong arm powers. And some states, and I believe, I believe, I'm not totally sure about this, but I believe in Virginia, there is no statute of limitations and latches governs. I, I'm, I hate to say it, but don't quote me on that, but I think that's the case. That makes it much more difficult. So sometimes, and many times, you don't have the luxury uh, of waiting. If you do have the luxury of waiting, and if it matters, if the debtor if that doesn't care whether the avoidance action is there, um, then that's a different story. But if it's going to hurt the debtor, or hurt the debtor's principal. In a, with a small business case, the debtor, let's say, let's just say it's a small business corporation. Obviously, there's a legal distinction between the debtor, who's the corporation, and the principal. But we all know that for all intents and purposes, really, except for the ethical rules and, you know, uh, role, uh, other rules of professional conduct, your client is the principal. Um, I mean, we, we, that's just the way it is, but that isn't true. Anyway, under the law, that's not true. The point is, um, by setting a bankruptcy case in motion, you, you, need, you need to understand where all the ramifications are that will happen by filing the bankruptcy. And in addition to preferences and fraudulent conveyances, just putting the debtor or the debtor's principles under a microscope, which happens when you file a bankruptcy, as it should, uh, because that's bankruptcy is the microscope part, examining all these transactions and being able to ask all these questions and being able to get answers. That's the quid pro quo for getting the bankruptcy relief. It's a fair trade-off. Um, but before you put them under that microscope, you need to make sure what can be seen from that microscope. And of course, your client needs to understand that as well. All of that becomes heightened because of this immediate shutdown of businesses, which we haven't even really begun to see the effect of it yet. That's really the end of my presentation. Um, we're going to open the floor for questions. Before I stop, though, I'd like to tell you, I'd like to thank you all for um, attending um, 
this program. This is our first um, webinar. We are intending to do a series of COVID-19 webinars, um, COVID-19 bankruptcy webinars, um, as part of the MSBA's endeavor to bring free CLE to its members during these times. Um, and um, we already have our next one planned. It's going to be on June 5th at 1 o'clock. It was just set today. It's going to be on forbearance issues um, under the CARES Act. Um, at the moment, it's student loans and mortgages, but I'm, I'm not on that panel. It, it may expand to other forbearance issues. Future programs that were also that are in the works right now but not planned are dealing with claims in bankruptcy. Um, the way the claims are dealt with in bankruptcy, and I'm not talking about proofs of claim that creditors file. I'm talking about like the, the MSBA did a program on force majeure and insurance claims. I'm talking about those kinds of claims and personal injury claims as well, What how they're treated in a bankruptcy case. That may take two webinars, and we have more subjects that we'll come up with. But um, this is our flagship program, and frankly, we're all thrilled not only to be doing it, but that you've attended. I'll turn it over to Richard London now. Thank you. Richard, your mic is muted. Okay. I see we had a question for early on. This might be a question for Robert. It has to do with the student loan. Um, if the federal student loan are in deferment during the Chapter 13 plan, does the debtor have to pay that amount towards the plan payments if it is not a 100% plan? Okay, so <clears throat> obviously if you have any more questions, feel free to send them in. One of the things that we look at uh, with a debtor's income and their expenses is Schedule I and J of the bankruptcy petition and schedules. Schedule I obviously will list down their income. Schedule J will list all their monthly expenses. And so when we're looking at anything like student loans and if they're, you know, we may ask if they're in deferment or not. And so when you're preparing your Schedule J, if they are maintaining regular student loan payments outside of the plan and they go into deferment, um, that expense will have to be accounted for when we're looking at disposable income and how the plan is going to be set up. I won't say, you know, every case is different. You know, in some cases, you know, the if the student loans are treated outside of a plan and it provides a larger distribution to unsecured creditors, that could be case that we could possibly look at recommending confirmation. If the um, student loans were going to be paid inside the plan or you know, separately classified, we would look at that too. So it kind of depends on the situation and it depends on how the, when you're looking at their monthly expenses, because if they're in deferment, there's probably no payment being made. So when you're setting up your Schedule J, you probably want to look at and make sure, you know, and find out, um, are they making a student loan payment? If it is deferment, then you probably leave it off Schedule J or put a notation at the bottom of Schedule J. There's a, a box that you could fill in that, you know, say, you know, it could be that, you know, the student loans will be in deferment for a period of 12 months and then the regular payment will be $200 a month. But I think the, the important part is to communicate with the trustees and what your client's intentions are regarding the student loans and what are the best solutions for them? It could be an income contingent plan. It could be whatever options they have, but you know, just every case is a little bit different. Okay. Um, there was one other question on, on student loans, not so much a question, but an issue. Um, I noticed that at the end of the slide, it says that um, on the um, suspension of payments that um, it will not be treated as um, a default for credit reporting purposes. Um, we should also be aware, Bud mentioned forbearance. If you contact, if a consumer contacts a creditor and says that because of the uh, coronavirus situation, they need to get a deferral of a car loan or a mortgage loan or their credit card or what have you, that cannot be negatively reported if you get the forbearance period. So whatever status your 
uh, credit reporting was at the time will remain static. And once the forbearance period is over, then it picks up again. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions here. Um, actually, there's a question about the um, uh, one of the stimulus programs that really isn't part of our program. Uh, so I don't know that we want to get into that. Um, anything else that anyone has out there in the audience? Any other comments that we have from any of the participants? Okay. Well, if that's the case, I thought it went very well and um, there'll be a recording. And if anyone else has any other questions, we, we are having some further programs. And now um, I guess we turn it back to Andrea. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you very much to our faculty today, trustees Rebecca Herr and Robert Thomas, and our experienced practitioners, Mark Kivitz and Bud Taman, for pulling this program together. Uh, we also thank our viewers, of course, for joining us today and hope that you find this MSBA service to be helpful. If there are topics you'd like to have covered that you haven't seen covered in the uh, 20 plus uh, webinars that, that Richard mentioned that the MSBA has provided during this pandemic, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and, and let us know and we'll do our best to pull those presentations together as well. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and take care.